Well, I know many of you are really into gardening. In fact, some of you have been talking about getting your garden started. But let me just tell you, gardening is not my thing. Now, I love to work in the yard. I love to, to plant things and grow things. But if you say, hey, Stuart, let's go till up an acre and start planting a garden, I'm out. I'm busy that day. Hopefully someone will have a funeral or something that'll take me away. I don't know. But my dad loved to garden. He loved to plow. He loved to till. He, he loved to plant. I never knew a time when daddy didn't have at least an acre garden. And most of the time, it was much more. At one point, we had a garden on three different pieces of property that my parents owned. We had corn and peas and beans and turnips and watermelons and squash and cucumbers and tomatoes and asparagus and broccoli and cabbage and potatoes and whatever you can think of, at some point, Dad had it. We had flowers, we had fruit trees, and we had blueberries. And I hated to pick blueberries because we had 411 dozen of them. And one particular time, we picked 30 gallons of blueberries in one day in the hot, humid heat. I hated picking blueberries because I didn't even eat the things back then, but I still had to pick them. There was a fall garden, a winter garden, a spring garden, a summer garden. It never ended. <laughs> one summer, Daddy decided he was going to make vegetable soup. Not because anybody wanted vegetable soup when it's 100 degrees outside, but because Daddy wanted to count how many different kinds of vegetables he was going to put in that soup. And when he got through counting all the kinds of beans and peas and varieties of corn and pulled out extra stuff from the freezer from all the other gardens, there were over 50 different kinds of vegetables in that vegetable soup. As much as I disliked gardening, though, I did learn something. That is, the ground matters. In fact, that's why we had so many gardens at one point, because the blueberries and the peanuts and the potatoes, they grew best out on our property in Forest Hill. But most about everything else grew best on the Latanya Bayou, where mom's house is now. But even there, there were things that grew better in the garden closer to the bayou bank, and there were things that grew better out back from the bayou bank. No matter where the garden was, though, the soil had to be worked. The ground had to be dissed and plowed and tilled, and we would rake out any grass and weeds, and then Daddy would till again, and the ground was pristine and ready when Dad finally stopped playing in the dirt with his man Tonka toys, and we began to plant. <laughs> and because the ground was so well prepared, the garden produced an abundance. I mean big stuff. I'm not sure at what point in life you decide to start taking pictures with your produce. But for Daddy, it was around 40 years old. Soil matters. Good soil will produce a crop. Poor soil will not. And Jesus once told a parable about soil. It's found in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three gospels are called synoptic because though they're written by different men to different audiences, and they all have a little bit different emphases and qualities, in general, they see with the same eye. Therefore, they are a synthesis of optics. That's why we call them the synoptic gospels. This morning, we're going to look at Mark's version of the parable of the soil. soil. So if you haven't already, please turn in your copy of God's Word to Mark chapter 4. And Mark begins, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and he sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Now, this lake here mentioned is the Sea of Galilee, which is really a freshwater lake. It's also called Lake Tiberias, Lake of Gennesaret, Lake Gennesaret. So clearly the Sea of Galilee had an identity crisis, right? Not really. It's, it's known by all those different names by the relation of certain people with it. So like Galilee and Tiberias refer to location. Kinneret is likely from the Hebrew word meaning harp, which is basically the shape of the Sea of Galilee. And then Gennesaret comes from the fruitful plain 
on the western side. So all of these different names for the same body of water, the Sea of Galilee or this lake. Now the banks there at that Sea of Galilee gradually sloped down to the water. So on this day, as Jesus was there and preparing to teach along the banks of the Sea of Galilee, he used that lake bank as an amphitheater. And he had the crowd gather there and he got in a boat and pushed out onto the water just a a few feet out in the water so that the water could then reflect his voice up to the people on the bank. You've been out fishing and heard somebody talking on the complete other side of the lake, haven't you? How that, that water helps to amplify the sound. And that's what Jesus was doing. So it's possible. So look again, look at verses two and following. Jesus taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, now listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. And then Jesus said, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now it's possible that as Jesus began to teach, sitting out on that boat, looking up at those people on the shores, he also saw a farmer going out to sow seed. And so he said, as the NIV says, listen, or as some translations say, look, look, a farmer went out to sow some seed. And Jesus paused and maybe the crowd looked. And they were familiar with the seed. In fact, most of them had spent their whole lives planting and harvesting crops. They knew exactly what was going on. And while they knew the seed, though, We do not because their farming practices were far different than ours. For one, where we typically do much to prepare the soil before we plant or at least drill plant and then uh, take care of the weeds with herbicides, the first century farmer cast the seeds and then plowed the ground. So picture this farmer going out to sow seeds into a field that has not been touched since last season. And so there's stubble from last year's crop, there's weeds, there's dead grass, there's, there's thorns growing. And in the days before John Deere, farmers had themselves. And if you had a little money, you might have a donkey. But most farmers just had themselves. And and most farmers did not own their land, nor did they lease their land. They were assigned their plot of land each year. And these plots were divided by little paths that went around them. So think about the different sections of the pews in this room as plots of ground for a farmer and the, the aisles being those paths around. So those paths got hard over the years of being trampled down and never plowed. And... At the same time, in addition, the ground in Palestine is very rocky. But unlike early American farmers and European farmers who would go through their their areas of pasture or fields and they pick up the rocks and build stone walls and houses and, and barns and that kind of stuff, the Palestinian farmers, those first century Palestinian farmers, they left all those rocks because they depended completely on the moisture from rain to come down. And that rock, those rocks help to preserve that moisture because some of those rocks created shadows. Some of those rocks helped create pools of the water that was there. But at the same time as the rocks were helpful in some ways, they weren't helpful in others because there were places where the rocks were, but there was just a thin layer of soil. And then at the same time as that, since there were no herbicides, weeds were able to come up easily and Often, no matter how hard the farmer worked at keeping them out, they could still take over the ground. So picture that kind of field. Not acres and acres of pristine GPS-guided rows, but small patches that were rough and left. And picture the farmer going out with a, a sack of seed slung across his chest, and he dips in his hand, he grabs a handful of seed, and he sows those seed into that field. And as he does, some falls along that path that separated his plot from others. 
And just as the birds follow along behind our tractors today, so the birds knew right where to go to pick off the seed that was cast onto the path. And then some of that seed that he cast fell in the rockier places of the plot. And, and they found some good moist dirt there. And so they, they sprouted up and they grew quick and strong. But having no depth, the roots soon dried and the plant scorched in that heat. Other seed fell among the briars. And the briars would be later plowed under, of course, when the farmer came through with his plow. But as it would allow the seed to sprout up and grow quickly, but then those briars would just simply reroot, and then they would catch up and surpass the plant, choking out the sunlight and stealing the moisture and nutrients from the ground. And then, of course, other seed fell on good soil. When turned under by that plow, this seed sunk into the moist, fertile ground. It, it took root. It grew. And with nothing to compete with it for its uh, needed nutrients, it received those nutrients from the sun and the soil and the moisture. And it grew every day until it produced a crop 30, 60, 100 times the number of seeds that the farmer had sown. And after telling the story, Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. What does that mean? It means simply think about it. Let this sink in a minute. Don't miss what I'm trying to say. Do you get it? Some did. Some didn't. Some wondered, why did Jesus just talk about planting seeds and soil? Everybody here knows what that is. What a waste of time. I thought this guy was something special. Are you ready for lunch? Let's go. But then there were others who sat there thinking, there's more to this. You see, Jesus could see the eyes of the crowd. And the sight he saw that day was the same sight every preacher sees when he stands at a pulpit preaching a message. Some folks are engaged while others are glazed. <laughs> and for those that are glazed, it seems like their eyes are blind and their ears are deaf. It's a it's a sad sight, and it's one of the reasons why Jesus spoke in parables, because he wanted people to wake up and to listen, and uh, the parables caused people to have interest and to listen to what he was saying, and hopefully to hear the gospel message that he was trying to communicate. But still, in so many people, Jesus still saw blank eyes. They were just staring back at him. They were blinded by selfishness and pride and laziness and indifference, so Jesus said in verses 11 and 12, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, everything is said in parables. So, he quotes Isaiah, that they may be ever seen, but never perceiving, and ever hearing, but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Isaiah said, when he came to preach to God's people a message that God had given him, it was like God had shut their hearts because they would not listen. It was really more their doing than the Lord's doing, but Isaiah felt like he was just preaching to a brick wall, and at times Jesus felt the same way. Because people left and said things like, oh, what's the point of all of that? Or they might have even said, well, that was just so interesting. But there was no heart change. There was no true response to the message that was being preached. The people were checking boxes in a glazed-over stupor of spirituality. As William Barclay writes, when Jesus said this, he didn't say it in anger or irritation or bitterness or exasperation. He said it with the wistful longing of frustrated love, the poignant sorrow of a man who had a tremendous gift to give, which people were too blind to take. The people listening to Jesus were missing out. And we do too. And how many times have I preached a message on salvation, but no one has moved? Was everybody in the room saved that day? I doubt it. How many times have I preached a message on repentance, and people have met me at the back door and said, I enjoyed that message today. How in the world do you enjoy a message on repentance? Were you listening? <laughs> I didn't enjoy preaching it. How many times have I preached on marriage and 
I've encouraged people to come and to intercede with God for their marriage or for their child's marriage or their grandchild's marriage or even come and thank God for their marriage. And, and so you might not have a problem. You just want to thank God for something. And nobody moves. Does that mean every marriage is perfect? I doubt it. Does it mean no one is thankful for their marriage? I hope not. <laughs> we just glaze over. But then I have to think about how many times I've not been in the pulpit, but I've been in the pew. And I've glazed over as well. Sometimes we focus on the wrong thing. That could be the quality of the preacher. You know, I enjoyed the sermon. Well, well, that's great. I don't want you to be bored, but I, I want you to get the message. Because that's what it's all about. Or maybe we're focused on everyone else, like the lady that came to church every Sunday, sat through church, and then had, she went out the door every Sunday morning. She said, well, preacher, you sure let them have it today. And she did that every day, every day, every Sunday, every Sunday, and then finally one Sunday happened, and for some unknown reason, only she and the preacher showed up for church. And so on the spot, the preacher changed his message to preach just to her. And he preached his heart out. He went 45 minutes that day preaching to that lady. And on the way out, she said, well, preacher, I sure wish everyone else would have been here to hear that message that you had for them. <laughs> you know, we focus on the wrong things, don't we? It's like when we look at stained glass. You know, we can dwell either on the color of the glass or on the light that makes the glass beautiful. You see, sometimes we stop in spiritual senses at the things that are meant to enhance the light instead of focusing on the light itself. And so the things that are meant to reveal instead obscure what we're supposed to see. And that's what's so frustrating and disappointing. Yes, the preacher is good, but don't miss the message. Uh, yes, the message is for others, but it's also for you. And yeah, the glass is beautiful, but don't miss the sunshine beyond it. There's so much more. So we need to wake up. We need to snap out of it. We need to clean the wax out of our ears and, and listen and pay attention and see the truth that is in the story, not just the story itself. So that's why Jesus explains the parable in verses 13 through 20. He walks us back through each of those four soils to help us understand them. Look at verses 13 and 14. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. So immediately we find out that the farmer is God. Or it's anyone who God has given as his ambassador. So that could be a preacher, a missionary, a Sunday school teacher, or any Christian who is sharing their faith with someone else. And then he sows the word. So the seeds are the word of God, which can be any truth from God's word. It could be the gospel. It could even be Jesus himself because he is the word incarnate. But what do the soils represent? It could have been that as Jesus sat there in that boat looking up at that amphitheater of a bank at all those people, he saw in them four types of soil that that farmer would also encounter. And the first was the path. Verse 15, some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. On those hard paths, a Pea seed was as likely to grow as a piece of pea gravel. Nothing was going to sprout, whether it was a rock or a seed, because that ground was so hard. For people like this, they cannot receive the word. It doesn't even go into their ears. Some people who are hard in their path are harsh to the gospel. Hard hearts do not get the gospel. And so they don't want anything to do with it. They're offended. They're disgusted by it. They will promote wokeness and evolution and critical race theory. Those are great. But then they'll say, no, you can't pray in school. Don't you dare pray on a football field. Get rid of those Christian clubs and let's ban the Bible. The birds come in. 
as Satan. Peck, 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 peck. And the word is gone from those folks' lives. However, other people with hardened hearts are not harsh to the gospel. They're just indifferent to it. They, they really don't see the point. What's the point of the word? Why, why go to church? That, that doesn't make any sense. Why read the Bible? You still have problems? Why tithe? All the church wants is our money. That's all they want. What's the point? It doesn't make any difference. And, and these folks will rationalize away everything about the Lord, just sweep it right off the hardened path of their lives. So there's this hardened path. But there's also the rocky soil, and it's different. Jesus says in verse 16, Others like seed sown on the rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Because those rocks have preserved that moisture, the seed germinates, it sprouts up quickly, but then the heat comes and the shallow roots can't find moisture and the plant shrivels up as quickly as it sprouted up. When Rebecca and I were called to pastor in the north Texas town of Forestburg and we moved into the parsonage there was nothing planted around the parsonage and I grew up in Louisiana I wanted flower beds so I tapped into a little bit of my daddy and I went outside and I dug up that rocky ground around the house and I got landscape timbers and I put them out I even went to Lowe's and I bought a little bit of dirt because you don't ever have to buy a lot of dirt in Louisiana right and I added that to the soil and I mixed it up mom and dad dug up all kind of stuff from their house and drove it over to Texas and and I spent time planting it out and I tell you what in May it looked good and then in June it kind of stalled out and then in July it didn't matter how much I watered that stuff The scorching heat, the constant wind, and that rocky soil just shriveled everything up. That happens in people's lives, too. Early in my ministry, I served as a youth minister, and then I continued helping with students as I served in other positions. And and one summer at camp, we had a great time. We came back to have a Sunday night youth service. You know, we used to do that back in the day where the youth would report and share testimonies and sing the songs of camp and all that great stuff. And so this one girl shared her testimony about how wonderful camp had been. And she was aglow with Jesus. And she, was, she loved Jesus. And, and, and she was so dedicated to Jesus. In fact, she was more dedicated to Jesus now than those adults who'd been attending Sunday night church for 50 years. And then fast forward a month. And Susie saints a lot was nowhere to be found because she had sprung up quickly. But then she went to school and got in the other peer groups and, and the scorching heat shriveled her up. You see, home environments can be like the scorching sun with parents or spouses who do not support a new Christian. Peer groups can pull us down. The shiny seduction of sin can search, can, can scorch us as its rays beat down upon us. Home environments can be like that scorching sun. Our friends can be like that scorching sun. And it causes us to have that, well, we have just that rocky soil. So we've got hard ground. We've got rocky ground. Then there's the thorny soil, Jesus explains in verses 18 and 19. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word. But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires of other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. And that describes far too many Christians today. I'm going to follow God. And then weeks pass and we say, hey, man, we've been missing you at church. Yeah, I know, we, we just got busy. I know, we got just a lot of stuff going on with the kids. And we had some trips and a lot of stuff going on at work. We'll be there after fill in the blank. The problem is after fill in the blank is like my daddy's gardens. It never ends. There's always something. And you'll continue to be out there unless you go buy some spiritual roundup and you kill the weeds and the thorns in your life. In fact, let me say this. Don't just come back to church. Now, before you say, good Lord, the preacher just told people don't come back to church. No, listen to me. Don't just come back to church because if you just come back to church, you'll be here a week or two and then you'll be gone with some weed again. You don't need to just come back to church. You need to come back to God. 
Because you see, yeah, you can come back to God here at church, but it's God that's going to keep bringing you back. And God's who's going to keep you growing in your relationship with him. So come back to God. A drift from church is a drift from God. Let me ask you this about life assessment. Have you spent time with God in a devotional every day? Spent time with God, just, just asking the Lord to be with you and, and praying and seeking his face. Say, oh, no, I've just been busy. Well, I'm sure you have. But did you find time to eat? Maybe it wasn't what you wanted. Maybe you had to go through drive through Maybe you had to grab a granola bar. But I bet you found time to eat. And here's how I know why you're not dead. <laughs> did you find time to sleep? Maybe not as much as you wanted to. Maybe you had to work all night and you're here this morning. But you know what? You'll find time to sleep because otherwise you'd be dead. Not to be indecent, but did you find time to use the bathroom? Because if you didn't, you'd be dead. So, is it any wonder that if you haven't spent time with the Lord, you feel spiritually dead? Stop letting the thorns come up in your field. Get rid of them. I think I've told this story before, but when my grandma was close to 85, she got aggravated. She had leased her pasture behind her house, hay pasture, to some guy, and he wasn't taking good care of it. And so when she'd go out to her garden every day, she'd look out across that hay field, and she would see thistles coming up. And my mom knew that a thistle today is a thousand thistles tomorrow. And so she went back, and she got her hoe, and she said, if he's not going to do it, I am. And she went out there every morning and every evening in the cooler parts of the day and chopped down as many thistles as she could at 85 years old until she had chopped down every thistle in that field. And to this day, 15, 20 years later, there's still not a thistle in that hay meadow. Now, obviously, other things have been done in those 20 years to keep those thistles out. But I never pass by that thistle field still today that I don't look when I'm on my way to mom's house and see no thistles and say, keep the thistles out of your hay. We need to be as diligent about keeping the weeds and thorns out of our lives as mama was keeping those thistles out of her pasture. Every day, cut them down. Get rid of them because one today is a thousand tomorrow. Guard your life closely. There's hard soil, there's rocky soil, there's thorny soil, and of course there's good soil. In verse 20, others like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop 30, 60, even 100 times what was sown. Does that really need any explanation? In fact, at LeCount, I asked them, does that really need any explanation amongst a bunch of farmers? <laughs> Who know good soil? Good soil grows good things. It produces a, a crop, a bountiful crop. That's how every believer's life should be. It should be full of fruit. Not just the missionaries, not just Sunday school teachers. Everybody should have fruit coming out of their lives in various ways. Fruit in your children and grandchildren who are serving the Lord. Fruit in friends who've come to faith in Christ because they saw something in you and you were able to share your faith with them. Fruit in just your life and your personal faith and how you're growing every single day in the knowledge of God. Fruitful every single day. So much so that one day God is like my dad with his Cushaw and his watermelons and his sunflowers and all the other stuff he took pictures with because he was proud of the produce where God could stand beside you and say look at the fruit look at the size of this watermelon look at the size of this Cushaw look how many tomatoes this person produced God wants to be proud of you and to celebrate the fruit that you produce this weekend changed me we've done a lot of introspection in fact one member texted me what many of us probably thought, okay, I give, don't make us read anymore in Steve Horn's book, ouch. Because there were just question after question after question that penetrated to us. Introspection is hard. But I hope the process helps you prepare your soil because this week we move from introspection to the process known as consecration. And that is where we... we dig down into God's Word, and we dedicate ourselves to the purpose of growing in the Lord. So your soil has got to be ready because it's planting season, and there's going to be some things done. So we come to the question then of our message title, and that is, 
How is your ground? Is it hardened? Is it rocky? Is it thorny? Or is it good? If it's one of the third, first three, it doesn't have to stay that way. Because, you see, while some people today will try to say that, oh, well, if you're hard, hardened, you can't ever, there's no hope for you. I don't know about that because the Bible I read says we serve a God who can break the hard ground. And we serve a God who can change a stony heart into a heart of flesh. And we serve a God who can get the weeds out of your life. But what it takes for all of those is repentance. Coming to him and saying, Lord, change me. Break up the ground. Get out the stones. Take out the weeds. So we want to do that this morning. We want to say, Lord, change me.